Hey, welcome Teach Lab listeners. We've got a great two-part series coming up this month, um, looking at personalized responses, tutoring responses to unfinished learning from the pandemic. Part one is going to have Matthew Mugo Fields from Houghton Mifflin, and part two is going to have Matthew Kraft from Brown University. So two mats talking about tutoring in response uh, to some of the challenges of helping students uh, become their best selves during the pandemic. Enjoy. From the home studios of the Teaching Systems Lab at MIT, this is Teach Lab, a podcast about the art and craft of teaching. I'm Justin Wright. Today's guest, Matthew Mugo Fields. He's an educator and entrepreneur and the general manager of Supplemental and Intervention Solutions at Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, where he's been since 2017. He's the co-founder of Innovation for Equity, a nonprofit organization that promotes innovative ways to improve life outcomes for black learners of all ages. Matthew has also founded education startups, including Redbird Advanced Learning, a personalized learning company, and Rocket Group, the United States' largest provider of in-school tutoring. Matthew holds dual master's degrees in business and education from Harvard University and is an honors graduate of Morehouse College. He's the host of the Shaping the Future podcast. Welcome, Matthew. We're really happy to have you here on Teach Lab. Thank you, Justin. It's great to be with you today. Um, these are intense times. How are you doing? You know, I guess the saying these days is um, COVID good. Um, COVID good. It, it, yeah, acknowledging there's, there certainly is a cap on it, um, on how good one can be, um, you know, but, but, but generally speaking, um, quite privileged in that family is safe and healthy um, and, you know, everyone is, 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 is doing well. Um, I have a 17, soon to be 18 year old daughter who's uh, in primarily remote school these days, like many kids around the country. And is she a junior um, she or is, a senior? Yeah, she's a she's a junior here in Boston. And uh, and, and, you know, it, it has definitely been an interesting and challenging year as as everyone out there knows. But um, she she is she is thriving uh, academically. Uh, so we're very, very fortunate. Um, how about you? So I have a seven and 10 year old um, and uh, my family's had a cabin in Barnard, Vermont, um, which is in rural Vermont for a long time. And, and all of my work is remote. So we moved up here um, uh, for, for two yeah. reasons. One, the schools are open because it's very, you know, I've got their kids go to an elementary school with 82 kids. Um, and then strangely enough, the six towns around mine form a municipal broadband cooperative. Um, so the broadband on my dirt oh, wow. road, which is not uh, findable on Google, is faster than the broadband um, in Arlington, Vermont, uh, Arlington, Massachusetts. Um, so How I have, about that? So o open schools and functioning broadband is like the two things to, to make yeah. things work a little bit. What, yeah, you're, um, you're in like a COVID oasis up there. It's, it's kind of a COVID oasis. Um, yeah. What's your, what, how is your daughter feeling about you know, the junior year, getting ready to apply for colleges, those kinds of things. What does that feel like? And I think um, last year in March and April, there was an enormous amount of concern from state policymakers about seniors. How are we going to get seniors to graduate? And I, you know, my sense is that policymakers still have a ton of concern about our very youngest students um, who, are, you know, are having a really hard time with online learning, but then a ton of concern about our oldest students who we need to help make this transition to their future. Um, how, how is, how's your daughter and her classmates sort of experience? Yeah, no, you, you point out two, two very um, real challenges. Um, yeah. And, and, and we're, you know, we're in an interesting position. She is, um, she, I'd say she, she, she's generally doing well. We are kind of gearing up for that, you know, preparing for, uh, you know, the SATs and SATs and, um, you know, uh, trying to think about what are the, the choices and going to the college counseling and all, all of that good jazz. It, there's a bit of cognitive dissonance because it's, it seems like the preparatory process we are engaged in is, is a little bit decoupled from all of the, the sort of non-traditional realities that are out there that exist. I mean, who knows whether or not, you know, you know are there going to be more schools that don't require um, tests um, yep. be taken, et cetera. So there's a lot of talk of that. Um, we're kind of taking 
uh, a more traditional approach, at least for now. Um, my daughter, <laughs> she, she's, a, she's a particular case. Um, you know, there are many different challenges with, with, with kids and, and thinking about college. Um, her challenge is, as you mentioned in my intro, I'm a Morehouse graduate. Uh, so since she was six years old, my daughter has had the pleasure of going to Morehouse and Spellman's joint homecoming. Yep. Uh, a bit of programming, I must admit. And that nice. programming <laughs> has worked so well that um, uh, she is uh, fully committed since about seven or eight that all <laughs> only school she's considering is Spelman College. And now since that uh, Spelman College's own uh, Stacey Abrams is so prominent in our culture, yeah, it's right. even <laughs> more. So, so getting her to consider schools beyond Spelman is probably our, our biggest challenge in the college process. Well, I got to tell you, there are far worse challenges to have to overcome than, you know, a strong commitment to one of the very best colleges in the country, which has made, you know, all these extraordinary um, contributions. We had uh, former president uh, Beverly Daniel Tatum on the show um, a, a couple seasons ago, and she's an extraordinary woman. Um, so one yeah. of the things we like to ask to get to know our guests is their ed tech story. Do you have like, any sort of distinctive or defining experiences with education technology, either as a student or as an instructor? I do. Um, uh, how long we got? Because it's, well, it's, 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 it's a tale. Um, well, all right. Well, give, uh, give us, give, we'll, we'll cut it down if it's too long. All right. All right cool. So, yeah. So, so, so the, my ed tech story is very much connected to uh, just my education story, right? Like many educators, I've been inspired to get in this work and do this work in, in an effort to, you know, pay it forward, do for others, what was done for me, that kind, kind of thing, which many of us share. Well, in my case, that, that sort of pay it forward came with very explicit instructions. Um, this was, it was not optional. Um, you know, I, I'm, uh, you know, I, it wasn't that long ago, you know, I came to the United States, low income immigrant kid, uh, you know, right, Title I, you know, that, that kind of thing, free lunch kid, um, had had some early academic success in my native country of Barbados, uh, but, you know, family left to pursue the sort of American dream. Um, and like my two older brothers, I was, uh, upon arrival in a suburban Philadelphia school system, tracked uh, to the bottom. Um, mm -hmm. and, and all the educators out there know what I mean when I say track to the bottom, yep. right? So, you know, fifth grade, 10 years old, told, hey, you know, um, uh, we think that, you know, there are great opportunities for you to be um, some kind of vocational um, uh, technologist in the future. Uh, carpentry, plumbing, those are things I was talking to guidance counselors about at that age. Um, and, and, and my life shifted because I, I simply had a, a teacher who, who intervened and quite frankly, fought the system, uh, seventh grade ELA teacher who said, hey, this kid is actually capable of much more um, I, and started, you know, a, a, a sort of working with me after school and tutoring me and, and also getting her friends who were other teachers to kind of support that I, I needed to be in a, on a different track. And, and eventually that came to pass. And, you know, I was, I was, by the time I was in eighth grade, I was honors track, doing well in school, looking at, you know, college preparatory for high school, all that good stuff. But those teachers, that little group, they didn't stop there. Even though I left their school and went on to high school, they stayed in my mm. life. They, you know, it got to the point where I, when I was looking at colleges, like my daughter is now, um, you know, they, they were helping me select colleges, work on essay writing, all that good stuff, got into Morehouse, thankfully, and couldn't afford it, though. And those same teachers started a campaign and raised money in our community and people of all stripes, black, white, high income, low income folks, et cetera, chipped in and sent me to Morehouse. And the day before I left the Morehouse, that, that group of educators turned to me and said, now go do for other kids what we just did for you. So, so for me, my path literally started my first week at Morehouse. I, you know, I was like, okay, I, I'm here. I got to, you know, this is where Martin Luther King went to college. I got to, you know, I got to go figure out how I'm going to change the world. Um, and, and I started, you know, very <laughs> amateurly, looking for opportunities to do that started mentoring and tutoring some kids from the neighborhood neighborhood wow. uh, they became like you know my tag alongs and and uh it was really in mentoring one of those kids that i got exposed to sort of i, I began going to parent teacher conferences and helping with his homework and all that kind of stuff and what became clear to me was there's an opportunity here to provide sort of tutoring support 
um, for for more and more students. Typically, tutoring was was something the province of folks who who you know had higher means than many yep. of the students I was dealing with. And so I was trying to figure out how could I do that first on a volunteer basis. You know, I was I told you about my family's background, so so I had bills to pay coming out of college. So I right, went yeah, into yeah management consulting but i also was still tutoring on the side and eventually worked that into like cutting a deal with the atlanta public schools where i was teaching one day a week and i was still a consultant and oh wow and uh yeah so that was and and it was in that process i began getting exposure to what technologies what what, what year is that roughly that that you're telling that story yeah this is think late 90s this is golden era of hip-hop years golden era of (laughs) hip-hop But also just bridging in, you know, I mean, because one of the things you describe is that, uh, um, you know, tutoring is primarily the province of the affluent. But one of the policy things that starts to change that a bit, certainly not fully, um, but is the 2001 No Child Left Behind Act. Um, which dictated that if certain schools weren't meeting adequately yearly progress, that tutoring, um, you know, could be a service that could be required of some of these schools that weren't making progress. So, so basically, um, we're in the golden age of hip hop. You are getting really excited about tutoring for a diverse set of kids, kind of right at the moment that the country is starting to say, hey, maybe actually this could be something that's useful for a bunch of people. So I want to put that in context. But tell us, tell us what happens absolutely. next. Absolutely. Thank you for thank you for the bridge and the segue. Yeah, yeah, good. Because you know that's exactly what wound up happening. And so I was, you know, fast forward in grad school at Harvard, doing pursuing a dual degree in business and education at the same time. Um, and that law was passed. And one of the key tenets was, hey, there's there's now availability for tutoring uh, to be offered to kids from um, schools where, where there was some academic need. And I wrote a business plan with some of my good friends and created what became over a couple iterations, the largest provider of those tutoring services uh, through No, no Child Left Behind. Um, and, 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 you know, that was a, a very sort of formative experience for me because it was, it was on the one hand, kind of tried and true, pure, roll up your sleeves, entrepreneurship, you know, um, it was in schools on a daily, all, you know, certainly a, a couple times a week basis, uh, seeking to make improvements to the programs, because we were, we were not only, um, you know, providers of the curriculum and creators of the curriculum, but we also hired teachers to work as our tutors after school. So think teachers were kind of moonlighting, right? Yep. Um, and, and we were going into uh, high need communities, places like where I grew up. And, and we were first having to convince, you know, school districts and states that, you know, here's our program and yes, it's standards aligned and it's solid. Uh, but then we were also having to convince parents who, you know, didn't know they had access to these services that, yep. hey, this is now available to you. You can you can almost think of this as this is a, this is an opportunity to get your kid private tutoring. It's just happening at the school. And it's it's we're taking the best teachers that we can find who are willing to do this work and and putting them in small group settings. And we were blending in some, you know, com- combination of sort of constructivist um, teaching practices with sort of direct instruction as well. I, again, I'm assuming your audience will know <laughs> Uh, what, yeah, yeah. What and, you know, and you can't, you can't say to kids like, I mean, well, it's harder to say to kids. Yeah. You know, at two 30 PM, stay at school for an extra hour and we're going to flashcard you for an hour. Like there's, you know, if, if you're, if you're exactly. not forcing these students to participate, if there's a certain amount of opt-in enthusiasm that you have to generate, um, come, come get these worksheets, come get these worksheets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We couldn't do that. Yeah. Um, and to your point, I mean, we got, we got, we got pretty good at it. I mean, we, we have districts and schools where, you know, we had um, students sadly who would skip regular school, but come to the tutoring program because mm-hmm. it was a very different instructional environment. Um, it, it, you know, one way that one teacher described it to me, it was like, it was a lot noisier. It was a lot noisier um, than in regular school uh, and and by design, right? Because we were attempting to engage students in ways that they hadn't been uh, working. But as you know, that um, that law had its sort of time horizon on it. Right. And um, and and we, we, we anticipated that that was going to happen. 
um, and, um, and, and began sort of exploring and quite frankly, at the urging of teachers, more integration of technology, even into our tutoring program. Hmm. So, so, so it was teachers saying, hey, you know, this, this great game that we were playing and we're having with the manipulatives, you know, this music that we've integrated in program, boy, wouldn't it be good if that was on a tablet? Wouldn't it be good if, you know, we, were, we found a way to start leveraging technology more and, some, and potentially things that kids could work on when they weren't with us? And that's what kind of got us on the path, uh, got me on the path as an entrepreneur exploring, okay, more seriously, more deliberately, instructional educational technology. And that, and that evolution took me out to, uh, to Stanford uh, University um, and, and, and to begin um, working in partnership with sort of one of the forefathers, if you will, of, of education technology, a, a, a then 91-year-old professor at Stanford named Patrick Soupies, mm -hmm. who um, was, you know, one of the sort of yeah, godfathers. Yeah, godfather or, or yeah, of like, yeah. personal or, tutoring kind of things. Exactly. So, so imagine this, this picture of, you know, I'm now like, you know, early 30s, right? Um, uh, you know, Young gave you my gave me my background, you know, um, and I'm like having dinner almost every night with this 91 year old guy who's in the office every day. And he's basically schooling me on everything that has ever happened in education technology. We're going through, I mean, dense research papers that, you know, I didn't even understand some of the numbers like but I had to pretend I did. It was, yeah. you know, and, and became, um, you know, more more than a mentor. Um, uh, really, it, it, someone who insisted on on us kind of holding a standard, and so it was through that partnership with with Pat and the research team that he had been leading at Stanford, he'd been leading for twenty five or so years, that we created this thing called Redbird um, Advanced Learning, which was a startup that was grounded around mathematics and adaptive learning, but but you know a lot more than that. I mean, the headline was, "Hey, personalized learning math," but but the, the more detailed view is something that we knew, and I know this speaks to what's in your book, is that it can never be about the technology uh, alone. It has to be about sort of more comprehensive instructional systems that leverage technology, um, right? And, and, that, and that technology can play a key role, but, but if you're going to be serious about sort of um, tech, education technology, instructional technology at scale, you've got to be as thoughtful about implementation and how you're going to support teachers and using it, how you're going to coach them, et cetera, um, as you are about what algorithms you're going to optimize. And, and so that's, that, that's my long ass ed tech story. <laughs> well, that's incredible. You know, I mean, to put um, Patrick Soup's work Soupy's work in some context for our listeners. Um, he wrote a, I think I've seen this before. He wrote a paper um, for Scientific American called The Uses of Computers in Education. And that paper was published in 1966. Um, so yes. again, you know, another thing that I try to point out in Failure to Disrupt is that, you know, the effort that you joined in with Dr. Supizan is not a new effort. I mean, this is something from the earliest days that we had mainframe computers the size of living rooms. Um, people have been trying to ask the question, you know, what's the right alchemy of people, of computers, of students, of instructional design um, that, that, gets to some new kinds of answers. Um, yeah, uh, ag couldn't agree more. That, and that was really one of the things about, you know, um, the relationship with, with Pat and, and, and his work. I mean, he was doing serious scientific published research for 50 years on this stuff, um, yep. you know, like, 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 you know, we, 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 you know, today talk about, you know, yes, we have peer reviewed, randomized gold standard studies, all that kind of stuff. They, I mean, that was, you know, that was sort of par for the course with him and the work that, that, that he led. Um, uh, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't say, you know, a, a couple of years after we met, Pat, Pat uh, passed away. Um, and one of the honors of my professional life is I actually got to speak um, at, at his memorial. So, great. Um, yeah, it was, it was a great moment. The work goes on. So, I mean, here's something that I'm interested in. You have this really powerful experience in the seventh grade of a handful of teachers sort of looking at you and saying, like they probably did with lots of kids in different ways, like, 
we are not recognizing all the talents that this young man has. And we've got to figure out how to find a new place for him in schools. And it's like a very personal intervention. Um, yep. And now you're working at a huge publisher, a huge solutions yep. provider. Um, and the things that you all build in supplement, uh, in, you know, um, uh, uh, in, in, in intervention kind of, I mean, they're big products they're designed to work at the scale of of grade levels of schools of districts um how do you think about building those kinds of values you know the values you described of these like really intimate connections into these huge technology systems you know and they're not yeah. i mean they're technology <clears throat> systems curriculum systems yeah that, that that's such a great question justin um uh, and it's it quite frankly it's something i think about on an almost daily basis. And, and here's how I think about it. And, and, and you nailed it, right? It was a very personal intervention. Um, uh, and, and, and the fact that, you know, the teacher I mentioned, and I talk a lot about her, was named Mary O'Gorman. Um, um, and, and, you know, the, 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 it wasn't just the relationship that Mrs. O'Gorman had with me, but it was a relationship she brought to bear in my growth and development, including uh, building a relationship with my mother, which, you know, trust me, I was a, a eager to <laughs> stay after school and do some extra work, right? So, so there, that relationship was critical too. Um, uh, and, 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 and so we, you know, the work that I do today at HMH is we still believe in the primacy of relationships. In, in fact, it inspires how we approach D developing the technology systems that you, you mentioned, right? If, if you believe that sort of what is most essential and important, and we hear this all the time, we do large surveys of teachers and, and education confidence reports annually. And, and, and one thing never changes is, is, is educators tell us the most important thing in, in learning is the relationship between student and teacher. Um, yeah, and if, and we ask, so, if we ask kids the same thing, they will tell us the same thing. They, no, they, I don't like science, I don't like math. I just like, you know, Mr. Fields or I like Mr. Reich and, or, you know, and that's why I'm taking this class. Exactly. Exactly. It's the most important thing. And, and so, you know, if you apply sort of design principles to building instructional solutions that assume that you land in sort of different places than if you, if you, you know, centralize the technology or the algorithms, right. You land in a place where you say, Hey, the best and highest use of, of, of technology is extending the teacher. So, mm -hmm. you know, allowing the teacher to have uh, more capacity, more capability, save them time. That's, that's the lane for technology so that ultimately you can, you can create, hopefully, enough assistance and enough freedom for teachers to prioritize relationship building. And that's the sort of high level I can get into, you know, the, the, the specific ways we do yeah, that. Yeah, well, maybe give us one example of something that you've been working on recently or some, some change that you made or something that you've been working on for a while that you think does that particularly well, sort of, um, you know, what's an example of something concrete that you've been working with recently or that you've been working on for a long time that you think has hit kind of a nice level of polish yeah. um, that you wish more of your products had or that more competitors had or was, you know, just yeah. an important advancement from your perspective? Yeah, I, I, I can definitely, you, you, we can take up two hours. I'll, I'll so you stop me when, when you went over good. Yep, so, yep, so, good. so yeah, so, so one, one really clear way that we've sort of focused in, in, in my work um, at HMH around uh, extending to teacher and, and building their capacity is in the area of writing, right? So, so we know, for example, I think the latest national results are only about a third of kids are, are writing proficiently. Yep. Um, we also know from, from, you know, again, lots of surveying, lots of data, that part of the key challenge in improving the writing skills of students is that the way that you become a better writer is you have to write a lot more. You know, yep. revision is is the key to growing in writing, but the challenge becomes teachers don't have enough time to review all of this student writing and and to you know give the 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 feedback in many different loops that you need to improve student writing. So so we have a, a program in in our portfolio called Writable. Um, that seeks to do a couple of things to help address that that problem. Um, you know, you know. We're, we're, we're not wholly opposed to the, the idea of leveraging things like AI and essay grading to 
um, help teachers prioritize, certainly not to replace the judgment of a teacher, but to help teachers prioritize who may need, who, who may need some, some intervention first. Yep. Um, we also are leveraging that technology to do peer reviews. So, so leveraging the, the class. Um, we also know that there's a benefit to students when they review someone else's writing and give feedback. It actually helps their writing improve. Sure. So you, you get a bit of a twofer there. Um, and then we also know that there are ways, there are better and worse ways to enhance sort of user experience and workflow of teachers, something you don't usually hear a lot about in education. We as technologists think a lot about how do we optimize this workflow to make it easier for a teacher to not have to spend, you know, the Saturday night uh, grading a whole bunch of different uh, papers and maybe only getting one revision from out of their class, but maybe upping that to three revisions and therefore growing student writing. So that's what we, one of the ways that we're focused on extending the teacher and keeping technology uh, in its lane, but, but saying it can, it can truly add value. Yeah, and I think, you know, educators have enormous concerns when they hear, oh, auto graders are just going to give feedback to my students. That's when technology kind of expands beyond its lane. Um, yes. I also, you know, there are a lot of uh, teachers out there who say, look, I've got 150 students. How much of this stuff do you want me to read? And we're like, well, if we could take those 150 students and make it a little bit easier for you, say a little bit something for all of them and to know a little bit more about which students really need some help and have some peers do some more work. Um, I think that can be, I think that can be really compelling for folks. Yeah. And it sounds like you're not only sort of expand thinking, not only thinking about expanding, the capacity of teachers, but really thinking like, all right, are there some, you know, spell check or other things kind of like, you know, what's, what's the next level of spell check, which we are all perfectly happy to have artificial intelligent agents, like give us feedback about our writing. You know, no, no one feels like we're dehumanized because Microsoft word reminds me every time I spell psychology PYS instead of PSY. Um, there you go. How can we help one another? Um, so that's right. There's a second piece of what, Miss O'Gordon did, which you described as sort of fighting against the system. There, you know, there are a few things there. I mean, I don't want to say it too strongly because it's your story, but it sounds like the system had categorized you in a certain way. Um, and, and, and your teacher said, nope, <laughs> we're not categorizing this student this way. You know, presumably the system like kind of didn't recognize your, you know, sort of all the strengths you brought to bear as it does every day with kids, you know, with all kinds of kids across this country, but particularly, you know, black young people, Latin American, Latino young people, people, you know, uh, uh, new English speakers, new migrants, new, new immigrants to the country. Um, is there a way that you think about, you know, um, supplemental intervention technologies? How are, are there ways you think about designing them that encourage teachers um, to, to be constantly seeing and re-examining the humanity of their students, seeing and re-examining the assets that your students bring to bear. Um, I mean, that's not commonly sort of what we think of as the role of technology maybe, but it also seems like, in fact, and, you know, in fact, in a lot of cases, we have great fears that what technology does is reinforce those kinds of things. Like, well, yeah. when we look at that kid's mastery chart, there's a whole bunch of red blocks, not a lot of green blocks. So you know what kind of kid that is. Um, you know, how, how is, is, there, is there a role for technology to play in that other kind of work that your seventh grade teachers were doing? Yeah, yeah. It's, again, a great, great question. And, and you absolutely nailed it, too. It, it was about uh, fighting against policies that were, were, were certainly flawed. I mean, you know, I, I, I don't remember, maybe it happened, but I don't remember taking a test or, or, or going through some battery of, you know, a portfolio assessment when, 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 you know, my sort of tracking was determined. And even then you would argue, right, the big problem with, with, with tracking students, it, it, you know, is making permanent decisions, right? And instead of, you know, maybe you, you make decisions that say certain kids need certain kinds of support now, um, but you, you tune the instructional program towards accelerating those students to standards, mastery, and yeah, hopefully, you, see, you know, in, even in particular, I think you see it less about identifying a person in a track and more yes. about finding a set of person's capabilities where they need more support. I mean, I think this is something, for instance, that like when, when people point to Finland as an example, you know, some enormous percentage of all Finnish students experience special services at some point, 
but not because they're like put into special services for the rest of their lives. It's because like, hey, I think this month, you know, Yarvala is not getting it. Uh, you know, is missing some piece of reading. So you you target and intervene and, you know, and then special education becomes less of a stigma because way more people are participating in it and so forth. You know, you sort of, you, you, you track around like finer grained capacities. Of course, all of us fall short of things that we want to, you know, where we want to be, where our teachers want us to be at some point. Um, so yeah, absolutely. And, and technology so, has a really powerful role in locking people into those kinds of systems and tracks. It, 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 it can, and, and technology can also do exactly what you're saying. Uh, if done right, you can add a layers of specificity to understanding what students are, are ready to learn, what they where they may have gaps in sort of prerequisite areas, send them back in some individualized, you know, uh, time, uh, whether it's at home or, 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 you know, leveraging a device in the, in the classroom. Um, and yet, having the, the solutions tuned towards accelerating students towards mastery of, of, of the relevant standards that the teachers are, are focused on. So that's a lot of what we spend our time and energy doing and figuring out what are the optimal paths that get you there. Because so, so one of the things that I think we have the benefit of, and, and, and this is where part of maybe the, an obvious question is, hey, Matthew, you spent the early part of your career being an entrepreneur and ed tech. And why are you at this big, you know, what some people used to call a publisher? We don't say that anymore. We're a learning technology company, uh, right? Why are you doing that now? And part of the answer to my, that question is the opportunity for scale increases the opportunity for efficacy. Um, when you have the kind of data that I sit and literally in a meeting I was just in today and review with our learning scientists and, and our assessment teams and, and we interrogate, what are we seeing here? What does this mean about um, these particular exercises we have students doing? Um, is, is there a way to, to better um, optimize the, the learning path or the learning progression that we've created that allows us to accelerate students even faster? When you have the, the, uh, the access to, we have about 25 million students on our platform right now um, at HMH. Um, they're, they're, they're a lot of the promise of what many of us hope we can do with learning technologies um, really becomes at, at your disposal. Again, all of that with the requisite humility <laughs> to know that we're not selling just technologies. We're not implementing just technology. We're actually implementing Instru comprehensive instructional solutions of which technologies are a key enabler. Yeah, you know, and I mean, just to go back to your story too, you know, your seventh grade teacher didn't have 25 million data points about you, didn't, you know, sort of didn't need that, you know, the real, like, if you have a choice between the sort of heart and passion that your teacher has and 25 million data points, you probably pick the heart and passion of the teacher. And then you've got to figure out, um, you know, what is it that can help extend the capacity um, of, of that person. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it seems like your, your career has had these kind of really interesting, um, uh, you know, being the right person at the right time to think about, you know, you're a tutoring guy and we're about to see another surge of interest in tutoring and support. I mean, I think yeah. the, the, one of the primary ways that the education policy community has framed, um, the, 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 the results of the last year, which I think we can debate this framing, but is this idea of learning loss. Um, mm -hmm. There's a bunch of stuff that kids were supposed to learn this year and they didn't. Um, and, uh, you know, either because we couldn't get them connected technologically or because we, you know, had, were, were forced by conditions to put them in these emergency remote learning, emergency hybrid learning settings, which are just not that good. Um, our teachers are not trained and experienced in how to facilitate these kinds of things. So they're just not teaching yep. as much, uh, you know, but also there, you know, there are millions of students in the United States who are living in contexts where their family members have died, where, you know, people are sick, where family members are out of work. Like, you know, if they're, even if there weren't these, if for some reason schools had been magically spared all of the effects of the pandemic, there'd still be an awful lot of uh, challenge and trauma out there to face down. Um, what, what role do you imagine sort of tutoring and personalized kinds of supports playing um, this spring, this summer, this fall? Like, if, I mean, if you have advice to schools and districts about thinking about this, you know, what, what feels really important to you right now? 
Yeah, yeah, uh, I agree with you. Um, you know, th there are there are many many challenges. We, we we spend a lot of time. I spend a lot of time with 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 classroom teachers, superintendents, etc. And 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 whether you use the language of learning loss, some people use that language. Other people think that's that language is inherently deficit minded, right? So so yep. I'm sure you 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 you've heard that. Uh, I think one we've thing been people around with we've been playing around with unfinished learning. Uh, unfinished learning. Unfinished okay, learning, I like it. Something that's it, you know, one thing that's kind of uh, intuitive in that is that the learning will be finished. <laughs> so we're yes, like, we're going to get yeah. to it. We just sort of time shifted a bit. Yes, yes. I like I like the sort of the the not yet growth mindset uh, kind of kind of approach to that. Um, but but one thing everyone agrees on <clears throat> is we do need. Um, some way of creating mechanisms for accelerated learning in the very near term to mitigate um, a lot of what's happened over the past, I guess, you know, year, tw 10 months, uh, let, let's say. Um, and so, so what I, what I have um, been focused on, and one of the things I quite frankly love the most about my, my day job is <clears throat> we have got a um, portfolio of highly efficacious um, intervention solutions uh, that, you know, these are, you know, similar to kind of the Supi's uh, research we were referencing. You know, for the last 20 years, we've been building upon and many folks on my team have been building upon and, and, and improving um, and iterating on the efficacy of products like Read 180, Math 180, et cetera. Um, uh, just to throw some brands out there that people would recognize. Uh, and those are, are, are products that are finely tuned for, for helping students that have, um, you know, significant learning gaps who are two or more grade levels behind uh, catch up, catch up as quickly as, as possible. There's also uh, a component where we're focused on how do we help teachers implement this kind of instruction? Because this isn't the kind of instruction that uh, many teachers are, are doing coming fresh out of a graduate school and programs. So, so thoughtful support for educators and how to accelerate learning for students that are, are behind. Uh, you know, I think almost we need to think about it in the, in the next few months as acceleration or intervention for all. Um, or all who need it. Um, and, and, and we can, there are proven models. There are, are successful stories. I, I, I get one of the central premises of your book, which, which I actually agree with is, is there's been a lot of overpromising. There's been an, a lot of like, you know, Hey, this singular solution is going to, you know, open up the sky and bring us salvation. And, 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 and quite frankly, that's, that's irresponsible marketing um, in many er areas. But I do believe there have been successful models where you can reference those. And then, and then the work now becomes about how do we scale things like that up to getting more, more and more students? And is part of that, you know, I mean, just looking at your title is kind of interesting. The, the um, general manager of supplemental and intervention solutions. But part of what you're saying here to some extent is that, you know, it, and I think when people, my assumption is that when most people hear supplemental and intervention solutions, they're thinking, oh, that's the kind of stuff we use with 15% of our students or 20% of our students. And we use it for 20 or 40% of their curriculum, you know, um, and, you know, but to some extent in, in the model you're just proposing, you know, like, all of the curriculum needs to be supplemental and intervention. You know, we sort of need to start saying, you know, when someone steps into the fourth grade after a rocky third grade, we, my hunch is to most of them, we don't want to say do third grade again. We want to say like do fourth grade and here's all the third grade stuff that you need that we're going to get in there somehow um, and probably make some choices along the way too, which is like, Hey, by the way, in the third grade, we teach some of this stuff and you don't really need it. So we're just going to keep rolling. Um, what, like, um, to yeah, what, that, what that, 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 your <clears throat> sort of part of the shop then start to provide more support, guidance, uh, direction to the rest of, uh, you know, what, what might be considered like, you know, the curriculum for regular kids or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a good question. So, so, and it touches on this, 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 um, <clears throat> this language we've been introducing of, of sort of connected teaching and learning, because what we, what we say is, look, absolutely mastery of grade level standards needs to remain a clear focus um, um, and, 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 you know, uh, getting um, all kids at and above that bar is, is something that we are we're focused on. And so to the, in that extent, 
sort of what you would consider traditional core curriculum um, is, 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 is super, super important because we do need to, to focus on attainment of standards. But what, what, what needs to also happen that maybe hasn't happened quite enough in the past is, is the curriculum of grade level standards needs to work in connection to supplemental intervention learning experiences. So when you detect that, um, as you said, hey, that, that student in fourth grade is missing some things from third grade and sometimes even second grade, right? Yeah. There's, a, there's an easier path uh, to fill in those, those prerequisite gaps. Right now, the way that happens in the average American classroom is they have core curriculum from one company over here and they have these supplemental programs that are sitting on the computer and go in the back 20 minutes, go on this, you know, here's the password, here's the other password, here's the seventh password. Um, yep. and, and those none of those technologies and those systems and, and those curricula talk to each other. There's no single uni unifying sense of what, what is truth about this student. There's no, no, and what we've, what we've done uh, over the past couple of years is, is build a single unifying platform that connects our disparate solutions across supplemental intervention, uh, core curriculum, a unified assessment system so that there's one version of where is, um, where's Patricia or where's Johnny really in math, in, in reading, and then what supplemental experiences make the most sense um, and trying to do it in a way that is makes life easier for teachers so they aren't having to go in a bunch of different programs and try to, you know, teachers, as our CEO, Jack Lynch says, is teachers are being forced to be human APIs um, yep. late at night often. Um, and, we, and we've got to solve that problem. And by human API, we mean, you know, what an API does is sort of an interface with the software program that sort of, you know, what, what these teachers feel like they have to do, um, you know, is sort of pull the data out of this one thing and the data out of this third thing and the data of this fourth thing and sort of get them all to be connected with one another and to say kind of what's the, what's the comprehensive picture here. Um, That's right. I mean, there are certain ways that I find that vision compelling. I, I would particularly find that vision compelling um, I mean, you know, certainly it's a lot easier to imagine in other countries in the world where they have a national curriculum. And, you know, for instance, like you would go get a teaching degree and while you were getting the teaching degree in how to teach science, it wouldn't just be like generically how to teach science. It would be, here's how you teach the French science curriculum. Like there's only, you know, there's one curriculum. And instead of, you know, you having to figure out how to teach, you know, Mobile Alabama's curriculum or Juneau, Alaska's curriculum, there's just one. And you learn how to do that. Um, you know, in the, in the American, so, so there's something very compelling about the idea that if like, there's just sort of one thing that we're teaching around, um, then we can learn how to use that really well. The parts can talk to one another. Um, we can, we can be, ha you know, we can be having conversations with other grade level teachers, with other members of our team. We're all talking about the same thing. Um, but the other thing that we see in the United States is that a big thing teachers want to do is like take whatever stuff they find on the internet um, and use it to teach because they feel like the comprehensive solutions are kind of missing the connection to their personal interests, you know, or like, you know, Amanda Gorman gives an unbelievably beautiful poem um, at the inauguration. And like, of course we have to throw out everything we're doing just to spend a day really diving into that. Um, Absolutely. How do, you, how do you think about integrating, you know, these kinds of, you know, comprehensive things um, uh, with, with teachers inclination to want to tweak and design and kind of follow their own path. That must be a tension. Yeah, yeah it, 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 is, it is a tension, but, but again, it, it, it comes back to, <clears throat> are, are, you, are you building your solution with the requisite humility? Because mm -hmm. um, if you're building it and think you, you know, you're the center of the world or your solution or no, you're, your platform is the center of the world, or do you really believe that the teacher is the center of the world? And are you really focused on you know, sort of striving to meet, meet their needs? So, so we know everything you just said is absolutely true uh, because we spend an intense amount of time um, ethnographically with teachers. That's just good product design. That's just how you build good products. You, you, you spend an insane amount of time with your users. Yeah, you survey them. Yeah, you talk to them, but you also observe them and you see exactly what you said, um, you're right? Amanda Gorman's uh, poem. I guarantee you that was the number one piece of curriculum uh, used in the, in the past. Yeah, Jan January 21st in English classes across the country was Amanda Gorman. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah. now I forget the name of the poem. But now we yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So 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 what what I th- what I think is key and the design principle that's relevant for us is not only just understanding your teachers and preferences, but the the other thing is creating flexibility for teachers to implement solutions as they see fit and leverage their their judgment and support. So in the language of sort of technology development, you would say support a variety of use cases. So so yes, we we have teachers who prefer to be who want something much more prescriptive and kind of out of the box, and and, and we support those. And but we create the option for a teacher who says, you know, I'm going to pick and choose because I'm covering this standard today. And I, I want the supplemental experience for my child, for the kids in my class to be tied to this standard I'm, I'm focused on today. And we, and we support both. Um, and that's something also that's new. I mean, one of the critiques I think you rightly have, and I certainly have lived through this, um, is, you know, some of these adaptive learning solutions, they kind of take over. Mm-hmm. They kind of like, you know, the algorithms in charge of what the kids get to experience. And we've really fought that. We, 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 we've created programs. We have a program called, called Waggle that's um, very much sort of gamified adaptive learning, but it creates options and teachers get to choose which, which content areas um, and standards the students are, are going to focus on. So it's like, it's like seeking to be best of both worlds. It's so funny you describe that. My daughter, um, as she was switching schools, um, sort of switched a math software product, and they sort of assigned her um, to use it, and it you know it sort of sort of put her back into review mode, and she was like, nope, not doing that again. <laughs> She yeah, like, exactly. really enjoyed doing it, but just like the system was saying, you have to do these activities, and she was like, nope, not gonna do it. Um, and, <laughs> and, and then you found out. Uh, she has the ultimate choice. <laughs> you know, young young people, you know, they can't always make other people around them do everything, but the capacity to refuse um, is one yes. that, uh, that young people carry with them in very, very powerful ways that we need to respect. Yep. Yeah, you, you got to honor voice and choice of, yes, uh, teachers, absolutely, and, and students as well. Um, well, I one of the things I so appreciate about this conversation, Matthew, is I think for a lot of teachers... Um, that, you know, their textbooks, their software packages, they just kind of fall out of the sky. um, And they don't recognize that there are a whole series of human beings um, who are, you know, product developers, who are former teachers that go into instructional design or software design, um, who are, who are thinking through all these things. So I really appreciate you coming on Teach Lab um, and just letting some of our listeners, you know, get to know a little bit more, one of the human beings who's behind some of the things um, that they're using, um, A, so they can send you nasty emails that they don't like it, but, pro- <laughs> but probably more, you know, more importantly, recognize that, you uh, you know, it's immensely difficult to build a tool that's useful to 25 million students, um, but there are people working really hard at making that happen. Um, yeah. Maybe the last thing we should say is that um, in addition to being a great podcast guest, you're also a podcast host, Shaping the Future. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about the podcast and what uh, what kinds of guests you have on or what kinds of things are coming up? Yeah. So one of the things I was most excited about talking to you about is you're, you're a pro and I, I'm, I'm a newbie at this podcast thing. So I was, you know, I've been taking some notes here and I'm going to uh, walk out with, with some, some good tips. Yeah. So, so shaping the future is a, a podcast uh, in the second season um, taking over as host. Uh, we start on the 26th of, of January, 2000. 21. Um, the real focus of it is geared towards an educator audience. Um, and we want to have, you know, innovators, thinkers, experts, folks who do work um, in education and beyond education that's future facing uh, with a theme of how do we better help students be prepared for an uncertain future. Um, oftentimes, you know, you, we nowadays talk about the fact that, hey, we're, you know, attempting to prepare uh, learners for, you know, careers that don't even exist yet, right? Um, um, and, and so we want to lean into that um, and have uh, guests come on. We anchor the discussions in, in education, um, in, in the, their own educational journeys, but also what they think should be happening in education based on what they're doing. So we have entrepreneurs and researchers. Our first guest um, uh, is, is, is Ben Tal Shahar. Um, he became, he kind of came to acclaim as the happiness professor at Harvard, um, right. had two, two of the most, uh, popular courses ever in the history of Harvard. Now he's, 
um, you know, branched out and has a happiness academy. And he's, he's coming on to talk about, you know, the role that schools can embrace in, in helping students live happier lives and some of his research and work in that area. So so looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to having having many great conversations like this one. Well, Matthew Mugo Fields, thanks so much for joining us. All right, Justin, and you got to come on the podcast. Um, I'll be there. I, I want to be there. All right. So behind those big, heavy textbooks and those clunky software packages, there are real human beings um, like Matthew Mugo Fields who are there developing those things, trying to support you as educators. I'm Justin Reich. Thanks for listening to Teach Lab. Be sure to subscribe to Teach Lab to get future episodes. And if you like our podcast, please leave us a review. You can check out my new book, Failure to Disrupt, Why Technology Alone Can't Transform Education, available from booksellers everywhere. You can read reviews of the book, check out related media, and sign up for online events at failuretodisrupt.com. That's failuretodisrupt.com. And join myself and Vanderbilt professor and author Rich Milner in a free self-paced online course for educators, Becoming a More Equitable Educator, Mindsets and Practices. Through inquiry and practice, you'll cultivate a better understanding of yourself and your students. You'll gain new resources to help all students thrive and develop an action plan to work in your community to advance the lifelong work of equitable teaching. You'll find the link to this edX course in our show notes where you can enroll now and the course runs until late August, 2021. This episode of Teach Lab was produced by Amy Corrigan and Garrett Beasley, recorded and sound mixed by Garrett Beasley. Stay safe until next time.